Hi, I'm Professor David Adley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. In this video, we'll be talking about how scientists, and astronomers in particular, make measurements. We'll focus on the reliance on the International System of Units, which is based on the metric system, but we'll also talk briefly about some bespoke units which are peculiar to astronomy. Let's get started. If you're familiar at all with the metric system, then you know the basics of the Système International, or SI, system of units. The SI units is the system of units of measurement commonly used by scientists across the world to take measurements and to communicate those measurements with one another. This is based on the metric system, but it includes a bunch of other derived units, like the Newton for a unit of force, which are not in what we normally think of as the base metric system. If you have ever lived or traveled outside the United States, you might be familiar with the idea that the U.S. is kind of weird. We don't use the same system of units that most other countries do. So if you're traveling in Europe or South America, you might see that rather than measuring distances in feet or miles, people in those countries generally use meters, um, or derivations thereof, like kilometers. Meters are the SI and metric unit of distance. Time, fortunately, is the same everywhere. Everybody uses seconds and days and years, but in science we also use some derivations from those which might be unfamiliar and which will definitely come up as we work through a study of astronomy. The abbreviation MYR, for example, stands for mega year. That's 10 to the 6 years, or 1 million years. This is very common in biology, anthropology, geology. So studies of the Earth over deep time seeing how the Earth and the organisms that live on the Earth change over geologic time. Sometimes, if we're talking about very long time spans on the Earth, we might also refer to GYR, which is short for giga years. That's 10 to the 9 years, or 1 billion with a B years. This is relevant both if we're talking about the history of the solar system and also the history of the galaxy and the universe as a whole, because the universe has an age measured in billions of years, or giga years, GYR for short. What about temperature? If you live in the US, you are probably familiar with temperatures measured in degrees Fahrenheit. But what are the SI units of temperature? Pause this video for a second. Go ahead, I'll wait. Try and remember what those SI units are. Did you come up with them? The SI units to measure temperature are Celsius or centigrade. Those are the different names for the same thing. That's what you commonly hear if you go and you hear a weather report in another country. They'll say the high today is going to be 35 degrees. And if you're an American, you think, oh, that's cold, and you put on a sweater, and you go outside, and you're sweating buckets, because that's actually quite warm. In lab sciences, especially in chemistry and thermodynamics, we also rely on degrees Kelvin. Uh, degrees Kelvin is the Celsius scale, but with a shifted zero point. Zero degrees Celsius is a very special value. What's special at zero degrees Celsius? What happens there? If you said water freezes, you're mostly right. In fact, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius at standard atmospheric pressure. So that's a technicality. So if you said water freezes, you got it. At zero degrees Kelvin, everything freezes. Zero degrees Kelvin is what we call absolute zero. It's the coldest possible temperature in which, according to classical physics, all motion should end. And there are many other units of measure in the SI 
and we'll talk about some of those in class as they come up. But in addition to those base units, it's also important to remember that the SI uses a series of prefixes to modify those base units for different scenarios. Um, for example, if you're measuring distances, you might want to measure tiny fractions of a meter using a centimeter or a millimeter, or if you're being very, very precise, a femtometer, which is about the size of a nucleus of an atom. Or you might talk about kilometers, distances between cities on the Earth. Some of these, like kilo and giga and mega, should be familiar to you from, say, computing, in which megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes and teraflops are all relevant units. But in addition to making a measurement, like it's a thousand kilometers from here to Timbuktu, when we report those measurements, we also need some other information. So I included two of the three important pieces in what I just said. I included a number, a thousand, and a unit, kilometers. But anytime we make a measurement, that measurement has some inherent uncertainty. We sometimes call that uncertainty measurement error, and that's the third piece of our measurement. Let's look at an example. Say I'm trying to measure the length of this thumb drive. Well, I'll look at my ruler and I'll say, oh, this thumb drive has a length of about 5.4 centimeters, but there's some inherent uncertainty in that. So the length is 5.4 plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. That plus or minus 0.1, that's my measurement uncertainty. Anytime we're doing proper measurements in a higher level lab or if we're doing real science, we should always calculate those errors and then report them. And then if we're graphing our data, oftentimes we'll use something that looks like this, that little weird shape that just showed up on your screen. The circle represents the actual measurement, but then that measurement comes with uncertainty. So we attach what's called an error bar. And that error bar shows the range of possible values given the limits of our instrumentation. So in this example, the error bar would correspond to 0.1 centimeters because my ruler is only that precise. When we conduct labs for science majors, like senior level physics labs, you have to be really, really careful to characterize your initial measurement uncertainties and then to propagate those through your analysis so you know what the uncertainties on your final results are and how those uncertainties might affect your conclusions. In topics in astronomy, we're mostly going to be neglecting that. This is targeted at a non-scientific audience, but there's always that fact that should stick around in the back of your head somewhere saying that no measurement is perfect and all measurements contain errors. And this is going to come back at least once when we talk about the cosmic microwave background towards the end of the video sequence. So keep this in mind for when we get there. In addition to the normal SI units that astronomers and physicists and chemists all use, astronomers also have a couple of distance measurements that are unique to astronomy because space is really big. When astronomers measure distances within the solar system or within other solar systems, typically we're going to report those distances in astronomical units, or AU for short. One astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. It works out to about 150 million kilometers, or 93 million miles, which is equivalent to eight light minutes. And what that means is that it takes light eight minutes to travel the distance between the Sun and the Earth. So if you look up at the Sun, please don't, looking at the Sun with an unprotected eye is very dangerous, but if you did, you're seeing the Sun as it was eight minutes in the past. To give you a sense of scale, light, like a laser beam, could circle the Earth around the Earth's equator about eight times in one second. 
So the sun is much, much farther away from the Earth than any distance that you might conceptualize from the Earth itself. So astronomical units are really big. The solar system is a large place filled with lots and lots of empty space. But the galaxy is even bigger still. So the galaxy, which contains the sun and all of its neighbor stars, if we're measuring sizes and distances within the galaxy, typically we're going to report those in light years, the distance that it takes light to travel in one year. That is around 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. It's much, much bigger than one astronomical unit. In fact, it's about 100,000 times larger than an astronomical unit. So if we're looking, say, at the distance to the nearest star, which is about four light years away, that means that the nearest star is about 400,000 times farther away from the Earth than the Sun is. It's not exact, but it's in the right ballpark. So astronomers can definitely measure things like distance, so the distance from the Earth to the Sun or from the Earth to the nearest star, but there are lots of other things that we can measure as well. Those include things like the brightness of a star or a planet, the size of that star or planet, its color, its temperature, and many, many other things, which you'll begin to see as you work your way through this series. One important measurement that astronomers make using the photographic equi equipment in our telescope is angular size. The apparent size of an object as seen on the sky, or equivalently, the apparent distance between two objects. Angular size can just be represented as a triangle. So if you look across the bottom of the screen, you'll see three different colored circles with three different physical sizes. So the red circle has a very small diameter, the green circle is medium, and then the blue circle is big. But all three of those have the same angular size because they're at different distances from that little disembodied eyeball. An angular size is the only thing that astronomers can measure in our telescopes. So if we want to know physical size, we need some additional information about the distance an object is from us. As objects get farther away, their angular size appears smaller. Thus, if I lean in and get really close to my camera, my head looks really big. But then if I lean back to a more reasonable distance, my head looks smaller again. When we measure angular sizes, we generally use fractions of a degree. Hopefully you remember from your geometry that you can divide a circle into 360 degrees. So one degree is a small fraction of a circle, but that's still really big as far as astronomy is concerned. So we often separate that single degree into tinier increments. For example, we can separate one degree into 60 little pieces, and we call those little pieces arc minutes. The resolution of the best human eyes is about one to two arc minutes. So the smallest thing that you can see if your eyes are really good and you don't need glasses or anything is in the range of about two arc minutes. But even that's still relatively large. If we want to talk about typical objects that we might see in our telescope, like, say, the size of a distant galaxy, oftentimes those things are measured in arc seconds. An arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute, just like a second is a 60th of a minute. So in one degree, there are 3,600 arc seconds. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, one arc second is about the width of a human hair held at a distance of 20 meters. It's way too small to see with the human eye, and that is going to be an important fact when we start studying stellar parallax and its connection with 
the heliocentric revolution. So keep this in the back of your mind as well because it's going to come back later. So, so far, we've talked about the systems of units that scientists and astronomers in particular use to measure things. Most of our measurements are based on the SI, or System Internacional, set of units, which itself is built on the metric system. These include a value, so that's a number, a unit, like kilometers or seconds or miles per hour, and then an uncertainty, which gives us an idea of how precise our instruments are and the allowed range of the true value of what we were measuring, given what our instrument is telling us. In addition to those standard units, astronomers also use some special units because space is so big. Those include the astronomical unit, or AU for short, which is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun, and also the light year, which is the distance traveled by light in one year. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon in another Topic in Astronomy.